638, and I will read it to you. And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned it to a servant at Zulamai, whose name was Haram. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. And she conceived and bare him a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Sheep Ziv when she bare him. And Judah took a wife from Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her, and raise up the seed to your brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Wherefore he slew him also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till she laugh my son be grown for he said least perverdenture he die also as his brethren did and Tamar went and dwelt with her father's house and in the process of time the daughter of Shuah Judah's wife died and Judah was comforted and went up into his sheep shares to Timnah he and his friend Hara the Adulamite and it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnah to share his sheep. And she put her widow's garments off from her, and covered her with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which is by the way at Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. When Judah saw her, he thought to her to be a harlot because she covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Will thou give me a pledge till thou send it? And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it to her and came unto her and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away and laid her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend the Adulamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be ashamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. And it came to pass three months after, it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? the signet, the bracelets, and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because I gave her not Sheila, my son, and he knew her again no more. I think it's interesting to note here that there was a custom in place that came before the law. And although we know that the 613 laws 
came in the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus and it's interesting that the very law that is in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, this law was given to Moses way after the story of Tamar. And so there was already a custom and a culture to follow this ordinance, if you will, that if a person's husband dies, that if he has brothers, those brothers are to uh, marry the wife and to produce a seed in the former brother's name. And obviously it seemed, seemed intuitive because it was already known and practiced throughout the land before Moses even received that law officially from the Lord. And so this practice we can see from Tamar's point of view has been accepted by her. She's a woman that has acclimated to this culture and custom. And during this time, this was a time where it was very important for a man to leave a seed in his family and to pass down his inheritance. And it was not the importance of the woman's name per se, because when she was married, she was considered under her husband's name. Um, matter of fact, I don't recall them having last names in biblical times. It was more of, this is so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, or this is so-and-so, the daughter of so-and-so. And that's how the names and familiarity of people would be passed. So it wasn't important for whichever tribe she came from and passed down from, um, it was more important the male's tribe and uh, the male's tribe was given more significance and if the woman came from a different tribe, um, their heir would be known as the father's tribe and she would be acclimated into that. So we've already seen a woman who came from outside the 12 sons of Israel. We see a woman who came from the Canaanites and she is willing as a Canaanite, as someone who wasn't called to be under the promise of God at this time, to marry one of the sons of Jacob and not only marry him, but agree with the culture that he came from and not bring in her own. I think that's very interesting to know as a woman uh, biblically speaking, that a woman is willing, at least Tamar was in her story, to give up her own culture and her own gods and her own understanding and philosophy and to accept her husband. And there are other women in the Old Testament that have done the same. Ruth, she comes to mind. Another thing I thought that would be interesting to examine here is the fact that the Lord says he changes not and even his son says he's the same yesterday today and tomorrow and if the Lord doesn't change it's interesting to ponder that that when a man displeased him greatly displeased him whether in his actions or his rejection of the culture that he as God set in place for man, um, that God responded to that. He didn't just let time or other men or circumstance take over that person's life, but he actually reached in and got involved himself. And it records here that he slew both of the brothers. Now, the reason that Judah did not want to complete the cycle of this custom with his third son is because he was afraid that he would be slain as well and he didn't want to lose his third son. Absent is the information of whether the Lord um, shared with Judah or Judah knew the reasons why his first two sons were um, killed by God. <laughs> And so Judah, interesting enough, he uses deceit. Deceit again, and I'll explain why it's again, but he uses deceit again to 
save his son, which is interesting because if you look back in the previous chapter, Judah was the one who came up with a deceit of finding a kid. He proposed to actually sell Joseph as opposed to kill him. And later, 10 of the brothers killed a goat, a kid goat instead to deceive their father and cover up what they did to Joseph. So it's interesting to note that he also, when he goes into Tamar and recognizes her as a harlot, um, he proposes to pay her by a kid. It's this consistent theme with Judah of uh, deceit or payment by a kid of goat. And that proposal of a kid to Tamar is very ironic because she was supposed to marry the third brother to produce a child, to produce a kid, to produce a, an heir. And he, in his ignorance, decides to offer her a kid, symbolically offer her a child, offer her, he meant a kid goat, but symbolically, it sounds like, you know, he's offering her a child which when they do copulate they do have a child which is interesting ironic and poetic justice if you will i think it's also very interesting to note that the lord who is very capable of responding in the affairs of man did not rebuke or chastise or punish tamar for her plan he actually allowed it and one of the reasons I believe that he not only allowed it but put his seal of approval if you will is because he gave her two twins as a result of that act and I believe that every child here on earth whether they were produced in a marriage outside of marriage by an accident by uh, forcefulness I believe that God sends children hear himself that he decides whether a child is going to be produced from sex or not and so he is blessed in this particular culture where it's known to have having children is an inheritance and blessing and a sign of wealth and prosperity from the Lord in this particular text he blesses Tamar with not only one child but two double it's almost saying you know that he's giving her a double inheritance for her particular situation which she was denied in the culture of their time to have the third husband or the third son as her husband and so if we look a little bit closer at Tamar, how interesting it was for her to come up with this plan. It was amazing and it goes into challenging of gender differences because I read this in Time Magazine and it states here that it is widely recognized a person's upbringing, culture, and other environmental variables play many roles in the shaping aspects of behavior that was once attributed to biology. Brains of males and females differ neurochemically and more subtly structurally. Right now, the effects of biology and culture cannot be separated. So even though there may be a predisposition in the structure and the molecular and in the hormonal balance of a male brain and a female brain, it also notes that culture does play a significant role in how that particular person carries out their gender understanding or identity, if you will. Knowing that, Tamar coming from the Canaanites, she wasn't brought up in any type of um, Hebraic understanding, but just married into one, accepted the customs. And now she comes up with this plan that's accepted and allowed and approved by the Lord. And
and that works. I mean, sometimes when you come up with a plot and you're evil and the Lord is against it, he may subvert it like he does for uh, Ezra and Nehemiah when, I, I, um, I cannot recall the man's name, but he tried to subvert them rebuilding the temple and the Lord intervened and allowed that subversion to come to naught. So it's interesting that she was allowed to do this, that her scheme is successful, and that even though men generally, this is not speaking of individuals because individuals within each sex vary more vastly than the two sexes vary generally together. And so it's known that men are analytical and logical and rational and think with the left hemisphere where the women are more um, creative, emotional, conversational, and think with the right hemisphere. So it's interesting to note that Tamar crossed over, if you will, no pun intended on the Hebrew words, uh, but she crossed over. I guess that is ironic because to be a Hebrew is to cross over. And so Tamar crossed over from thinking traditionally as a, a woman would, getting emotional about the situation and irrational and, and saying, you know, this isn't fair, this isn't right, give me the third husband, give me your third child. No, she comes up with a plan. She clearly has thought this through. She clearly has analyzed this. She clearly has a rational point of view. Um, and so she has taken these traditionally um, attributes that have been attributed to masculine thinking and she has thought them herself and has proven successful and prosperous for her. And even further so to prove how um, significant her analyzation and her scheming and her planning and her rationalizing has reached such a depth um, that she can only be called a master of it is that the three things she decides to take as a pledge until she gets this alleged kid from Judah are a signet, a bracelet, and a staff. Now these three things have significance. They have a symbolic meaning. The signet was a ring. It was a symbol of that person's signature and authority um, approving whatever it was stamped on. It's parallel to us today signing a piece of paper with our name. They did not do the same. I think ink, paper, pen, all those things were not only costly at this time, but they weren't widely available. And I don't believe everybody knew literature, how to read. They weren't all literate. Those things were given to a certain select people. And, and you can see the proof of this when scrolls or laws or letters were read to certain people. It was like his seal of approval. So she chose and received a sale from him, unknowingly getting his approval of the situation. How interesting. The next thing she took was a bracelet, which is argued as a cord, a cord that ties the signet ring to one's neck or a cord which you can cover or wrap yourself. I'm not sure which one is applied here, but nonetheless, it was cord, a cord to carry your signature or to adorn yourself. She chose this cord, this bracelet, something that holds things together. It's so representative of what she's doing here. She's trying to hold together the tradition and custom of the Hebraic People. The last thing she took was a staff. Now a staff was a man's symbol of power. If you remember later, the Lord uses the staff of Moses to prove his authority of him leading all of the Israelites out of bondage. And so the Lord does 
a few transformations with the staff. And so for her to choose well before that occurred, a staff knowing that it symbolized a person's authority, it's like she, she stripped him of his authority because he was not following the custom of the time. He was not obeying the rules of the time. He was not following the laws of the land. So she took his authority away because he was not following authority. So Tamar is very keen. I think she is a very wise woman. At this time, they didn't have courts of law. They didn't have the elders sitting around help deciding a case. So she actually took it upon herself to write what was done wrong to her. And God approved of it. And that's where Tamar used her creativity, her artistry, in coming up with such a thorough, symbolic and deep successful plan to receive what was rightfully her and so when it came time for her to be judged when people were ready to stone her and burn her and annihilate her in her great wisdom of thinking ahead because she didn't just say okay send me the kid let's just have sex and then I'll have my child I'm going to think ahead I'm going to think of what happens when I become pregnant during this time and people are going to question who is the father of, of this child, of my baby? So she thought ahead, got those three symbols from Judah and actually produced those three symbols when she was accused, when, when she was um, considered guilty, when she was talked about. She also, in her great honor, of respecting another individual, she said, I'm not going to embarrass him by telling everyone, you're the one who slept with me, you're the one who slept with who you thought was a harlot. She didn't even do that, even though that would have been correct and she would have been right in saying so and she certainly had that option to do so, but she didn't, she just said, you know what? I know he's going to recognize these three items that are his. I know he's going to know immediately whose they are and remember the situation he was in three months ago. So all I'll do is just present them before him and everyone else. No one else would know but him. And he can have the option whether he wants to reveal that information or not. But I'll let him know, you know what? This was you. And this was you because I had to reduce you to a crust of bread because Proverbs says that by a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread. I had to reduce you to a crust of bread because you didn't keep your covenant with me by giving me your third son in marriage so we can produce an heir in name of your first son. And immediately, all charges were dropped. Immediately, he understood what happened. Immediately, he called her righteous. Even though she planned and schemed and did this, he saw the whole series of events and called her righteous. And then the scripture says, he knew her again no more. And when I first read that, I thought, does this mean he, he wasn't there, the father to his child? But then the Lord reminded me, the word knowing in Hebrew means to have sexual relationships with, have sexual relationship with. So it means he did not further have any more sexual relationship. But absent is how he related to that child. Maybe he just left it with her in, in name of her, her first husband and his first son to raise up the child in in his memory and honor and respect but the story of Tamar teaches us many things as feminine women that there are times that we step outside the traditional feminine thought process in order to right what is wrong in order to think things through that at times the Lord may even step in and respond personally to certain situations that he's displeased with and approve and allow
about some situations that he is pleased with and that we must if we're going to do anything because I'm not a fan of manipulation but if you read this story one can say it was manipulative but that word manipulative does not need to have a negative connotation here it only means that she used an understanding of the situation to come up with a plan to make things right to actually follow the customs of the time and so if we as women are going to do something similar we must be like tomorrow and thinking things through and must be like her and thinking things righteously and that takes relationship with Christ relationship with the Lord and I submit to you or I suggest to you if you're currently not in relationship with the Lord or not close to Christ that here's your opportunity to do so we can pray together and you could come close to the Lord and he will receive you openly in his arms no matter what your past is and I just want to appreciate this story that says so many things to us that we can digest and and use in our current time and and I would offer up to you to read this in your own time and meditate over the things you've learned here and really meditate on all these events and ask the Lord to share with you what you can glean in your personal life from this. But let us pray now. Thank you, Lord, so much. I bless you and praise you for this, wow, this glorious revelation, illumination, information from the story of Tamar. I pray that this has blessed your people and that they've seen one of your women in a new light one of the women that have been recorded here in the word, in the first book of your word for us as followers of Christ to read. And so I, we really appreciate you sharing her story with us and teaching us many things from it. I ask now that the women that um, aren't close to you or um, are semi-close to you, that want to be close to you, that they put it in their hearts now that they desire to draw close to you as you are drawing them to you, and that you allow your presence to be known, allow your heart, their hearts to be filled with your spirit, and that you would come into their lives and help them orchestrate their womanhood in you, and that you, as Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our Lord, will become not only our Savior, but our Lord and our King and our Savior of our lives. Because someone who saves is someone who we appreciate and say thank you for saving me and keeping me and delivering me from that death. And death can come in many forms not only from the second death, but it could be many deaths or types of death in this lifetime. But to actually move Jesus as a position of King and Lord, that means that you will obey him. That means that you will submit to him. That means that you will listen to what he has to say and follow the instructions he gives you for your life. And so I pray this prayer of reconciliation and that you will now begin to not only draw close to his word and his spirit, but you will feel the effects of blessings in your life from him. In Jesus' name, amen.